Good afternoon. I will introduce myself properly in a minute, but I'm going to start with a heartwarming story and a question. Um, and the heartwarming story involves my three beautiful children, genetically surprising as that may be. Um, and earlier this year, uh, around Easter, we got the chance to take them into an OB truck. So I'm not from the broadcasting industry. Uh, I will uh, happy to talk to you in a minute about what I normally do. And they were fascinated. There's all these buttons and lights, there's cables going absolutely everywhere. Uh, but most of all, they were fascinated that on those screens behind, they could just peep kind of behind the scenes of what happened in yeah. at the event that we were at. So all these cameras that were pointing at places that you, know, you don't normally see, uh, people, the lady in the audience, you know, kind of as they zoomed in slowly on her, ready to take that shot. And yeah, they loved it. But I think the question I have for you that hopefully sets the scene for the rest of this afternoon is how exciting would it have been if instead of all of that excitement, what they saw on the screen was this. <laughs> and <clears throat> this is not the reincarnation of teletext, as fun as that might be for all of us. This is a ransomware screen, <clears throat> which is very typical. So if you are the subject of a ransomware attack, a very destructive type of cyber attack, this is the kind of thing you might see at the very end of it. So after a criminal's stolen your data, after the criminal has uh, encrypted everything, made it inaccessible, this is typically what comes up on your screen. And this is where I come in. So my day job, I'm David Cannings. I work for PwC now. Uh, my background is in critical national infrastructure, incident response, cybersecurity. Uh, and now my job day to day is to work with organizations, firstly, to help them build in security at the start, which is where we hope all of our clients would be. And then secondly, to help organizations through the really difficult kind of crisis situation that happens when you have one of these attacks. Um, our third speaker today, I think, is going to take you through what happens during an incident. So I won't talk about that too much, but I will instead set the scene. Um, and I'm a geek, right? I, I love understanding technology. That's, what I, that's uh, how I phrase it on here, but I'm a geek. I love understanding. We walked around the studios earlier. It's a fascinating, fantastic venue. And just understanding what goes where. You know, we were talking about the fact that lots of video feeds come into the building on IP, which is terrifying. Um, and yeah, so I think what I'd love to talk to you about today is the kinds of things we're seeing across all of our clients, so outside of uh, sports, entertainment or broadcast, and how they might apply to all of you sitting here. Um, <clears throat> so what are we going to cover? At a really high level, I'd like to cover what are the actual risks, so what are we seeing? Um, the so what, so why do people in this room care? You know, I'm sure you will use all of the same collaboration and productivity tools that we do every day sitting behind a desk in an office, but you know, you're actually out there filming really cool events. You know, what does that have to do with some of the things that our other clients do? And then lastly, I'll touch on what can I do, because I don't want to terrify everyone and send you home with like, nothing tangible to do. Um, so firstly, what are those risks? Well, what are we seeing across our clients? We are seeing increased connectivity. So everything at the clients we deal with, from the vending machines to you know, sensors that say how humid or how what the temperature is in a certain place, um, operational technology, I'll tell a short story about that in a few minutes, um, is increasing the attack surface. So all of these things are now plugged into the network. Um, in some cases, they're segregated, and that's obviously great, but in many cases, they're not. And remote working, obviously the rapid change that we saw during the pandemic has not gone away. So we still see many of our clients working remotely from all around the world. And you know, they've gone from five days a week in an office somewhere in the UK to actually being anywhere in the world. Um, <clears throat> and again, the security that our clients have built in often isn't there with that in mind. So they've shifted very quickly to hybrid working. They've put as much protection as they can around it, but the actual organizational infrastructure wasn't built from the beginning with that in mind. Um, and then lastly, supply chain. This is perhaps the biggest risk for our clients. Um, you might have seen in the news earlier this year, uh, there was you know, the allegation that uh, Conti, so this is a, a criminal group based in Russia, and again, I'll touch on them in a little while in a minute and how they work, but um, a criminal group hacked a lot of organizations and there was a BBC article that alleged uh, a large number, I'm not gonna name any, but, um, but you can go read the BBC article. And they're all household names, like high street brands, um, yeah, including some that we work with. And yeah, this was a big issue for them because one of their third parties had been hacked, yeah, their payroll provider or the person that has pensions rather than actually their organization. Um, so increased connectivity, and I, I sort of titled this, what is that on your network? Um, an increasing number of devices at you know, site here, I'm sure, have an RJ45 port. They've got a network cable plugged into the back of them, or worse, they're wireless. Um, a lot of these devices are unmanaged, though, and a lot of them lack enterprise security. So your vending machine probably was not built to plug into your fancy Windows Active Directory thing that's living in Azure in the cloud. Yeah, it's built to literally just tally up how many chocolate bars have been sold, how much money, and then send that via probably some 
some horrifically unencrypted protocol to some building management system. And the kind of questions or the kind of things we're seeing clients struggle with, what data are they actually storing? So you know, you've got all these things around your network now, how long is that data kept? Who's actually looking at it? And one of the things we see increasingly during incidents is that the technical thing that the organization has to deal with is dealt with very quickly. You know, they do a really good job of kind of rebuilding or getting back to operations. But the long tail of that, dealing with people like the information commissioner, the potential fines that come with that, um, customers or third parties that perhaps take them to court for losing their data, those kind of things are a big challenge. How do third parties do maintenance? So yeah, we just let them connect in via this VPN. And oh, they can't use two-factor because that's connected into our kind of corporate thing and they don't have a corporate account. And again, all these little things are actually you, know, you sort of weaken security to get their job done, but unfortunately leave a hole open for an attacker later. Um, and when were they last patched? Again, we have clients, uh, we recently did <coughs> sort of the annual renewal for one of our clients. And they this year, they were very proud because they got rid of Windows 2003. Um, <laughs> But yeah, when you look at their business and what they do and the kind of things, you know, the sort of very legacy systems they have, uh, they operate in an industry that has to keep data legally for 17 years. It's very hard to just get rid of old stuff. Um, and the case study, hence the very tangential picture of Wood. Uh, we helped a client uh, last year with an incident. They had a big ransomware incident. Uh, the one thing on their network that they could not turn off was this 500,000 pounds, so half a million pounds saw. And literally all this thing did all day was just chop Woods up into the kind of things that this, this company made. Uh, but it was connected to the network because it received CAD files from some fancy system where they did the designs. And then you, know, you literally, someone just stands there in the factory feeding in Wood at one end and out the other end comes this product. Um, and they absolutely could not turn it off. Um, they couldn't patch it, so they couldn't update the version of Windows because it's unsupported. They can't just go out and buy a new one because half a million pounds is quite a large investment for a small company. Uh, and that was a huge problem for them because they needed to go from running their business, you know, they literally had a factory full of people doing nothing, but they still had to pay. They weren't building goods, they weren't able to ship goods. Uh, and this thing, you know, this very, very old version of uh, Windows was you know, the, the core of that operation. And um, supply chain, so what's that on their network? Uh, most organizations have some sort of key dependency on a third party. For many of our corporate clients, that's the kind of cloud-based software as a service type solutions. Um, and you know, these are questions that perhaps the data protection teams ask, perhaps the cybersecurity teams ask, but actually you know, often that falls between the cracks. And um, we helped a client whose payroll provider was hacked earlier this year. Uh, and they, when they looked, every month this organization sent the payroll file just as a spreadsheet. And yeah, that was fine. What they didn't expect was that for the seven years this company had been running the service, those files were just sort of accumulating in this folder that was then stolen by a criminal hacking group. And obviously that's all of the data about us, you know, about how much we got paid, how much our pensions are, what bank account that should go into. Very sensitive data that's very useful to someone who might like to try and steal it. Um, and again, just this kind of case study to bring it to life. When we look at the incidents we've dealt with in the last six months, third party service providers, so this is your IT managed service provider, were the cause of at least three incidents that we've investigated. So when you kind of track back all the way to the beginning and you look at what account was used, it was an account that was associated with the IT service provider and typically a very highly privileged account. So one that has, say, administrative access can do whatever you want on the network. So a fantastic thing if you're a criminal group. Uh, and they're remote working. Um, so where does your network extend to? And again, we talked as we walked around this building today that a lot of production here is done remotely. You know, people can log in and change things in the very complicated kind of fabric of this uh, this building. Um, and you know, we all want to work at home, right? I don't want to be in the office five days a week necessarily. It's really convenient sometimes to be at home. Um, but what does that mean? And actually, how am I connecting in? Um, yeah, what's my home network like? Uh, because when I plug my lovely PwC laptop into my home network, it's a part of the network. Okay, my TV, my Alexa, everything else is also on that same network, as is anything else I've bought from Amazon for the cheapest price I could pay. So yeah, all of those things, and actually the security of these devices suddenly becomes far more important because they're not in a protected office environment where you know exactly what's inside. Um, and again, thinking about how staff and third parties connect to that, 
Um, are they same controls applied outside core systems? So bring your own device, it's fantastic. You know, it really keeps costs down, uh, perhaps for an organization. You allow people to use their own phone to check their email out of hours because it's really convenient for them and it means you don't have to pay 600 pounds for them to have a fancy phone. Um, but actually, what control do you have over that device? And as more and more of that scheduling and things like that comes onto uh, a different device, we don't want to carry two devices necessarily. The control over that is really key. Um, and we have clients that work in other areas, so certainly Germany and France, really strong workers' councils. You know, the concept that you as an employer would monitor an employee's phone is just an absolute no-no. Cannot be done legally. You know, over here, we perhaps wouldn't question it as much, but you know, these things are certainly a challenge for our clients that work in other parts of the world. Um, and password theft from bring your own device. So I, I'm still helping, actually. I spoke with the CFO this morning. I'm helping a, a client who had a ransomware attack in January. We were able to trace back, so when we did the investigation, we found out that the passwords were actually offered for sale in September of uh, the year before, so just over a year ago now. Uh, and it was effectively someone who was working at home. Their home computer had been compromised, so they downloaded something they shouldn't or gone to a website, whatever had happened. Um, yeah, all their personal accounts were in there, as were three, I think, passwords for this office environment where you know, they could log in remotely and they could do, this attacker could effectively act as the employee. Um, and the photo on the right here, thank you very much to Andy Beale, who's in the audience. This was a sort of demo, I think. Talked to Andy in the, the break afterwards. This was a kind of proof of concept for doing broadcast and production remotely. So I think on the next slide, we have uh, uh, a map here, and there's, there's a wonderful article in uh, online that you can read about, and all of these different sites. And the first thing, when Andy sent this to me very proudly and during the pandemic, and sort of said, look what I've been doing, um, I, the first thing that went through my mind was, oh my goodness, how is this all connected together? <laughs> yeah, you've got staff, and I think literally, I'll just go back to that previous slide. You've got stuff literally balancing lots of very expensive equipment on you know, what looks like a sort of desk from uh, a, a secondhand furniture shop and uh, on Peli cases. And you know, somehow that's plugged into their network, I assume, and going back out to uh, BT Sport. So yeah, obviously it is also encroaching on this industry. Um, Sorry? Very <laughs> Andy Bill assures us it was very secure. Um, I'm going to ask a question now. I'd like to solicit maybe two or three kind of uh, ideas. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of clarify a little bit. When I say recover, the actual recovery is months, if not years. Um, but I'm talking about I have my phone or my laptop. My company has a big ransomware incident. I want to be able to check my email, maybe use Teams, maybe access some shared files. How many days do you think it takes on average for a, for a company to recover to that point? Okay, two. That's a that's a good good start. Fifteen. Yeah. How many? Seven. Okay. No, they are all really good guesses. The numbers vary. Um, we always talk about it with our clients in terms of three days, three weeks, three months. The actual number that I pulled off this website, which I do trust actually, is 24. Uh, it's gone up slightly. It was 21 last year. When I went back to the website to verify my stats, they've actually bumped it up by three days. Um, and again, this is like access to basic business systems. This is not access to the fancy thing that I do in my job, you know, whether I'm a tax expert or a you know, broadcaster or in my case, a cybersecurity person. This is just being able to send an email to my colleague and being able to receive an attachment and maybe do something. And of course, for a business, that means sending an invoice or getting paid as well, which is, you know, for some of our clients, an absolutely huge issue. Um, and uh, again, I mean, this is the kind of example of what happens uh, when you have this type of incident and you, know, you are hacked by a criminal group. Um, this is the type of website that they operate where they will leak your web, your data. So it's called a leak site. And as you can see here, um, th the, the three of these columns contain some very sensitive personal information. You know, they contain passports, national identity documents. These are criminal groups that are very well organized. They steal lots of data from you and they know exactly what to go after to try and get you to pay them to make this all go away. And when I say pay them, you know, we're talking typically three to eight million pounds at the moment, roughly. Uh, obviously, they do negotiate. Yeah, they claim to negotiate in good faith. Uh, you can maybe get it down under three million, but you are talking multiple millions of pounds, which for any business is obviously a lot of money. And when I say that these are organized criminal groups, these are groups that are run almost like companies. So they run with an acquisition pipeline. You know, they have people who are dedicated to customer support. They genuinely kind of refer to themselves as customer support advisors. Um, they claim that they're offering you a service. So if you pay them enough money, well, they'll delete your data. They'll help you to 
get your systems back up and running, and then they'll send you a report saying how they got in. Well, that's, you know, kind of value added. Um, <laughs> and uh, we know, uh, we can say this with a lot of confidence because a few years ago, at the start of the, obviously, the very sort of tragic uh, world events in Russia and Ukraine, um, most of these groups are Russia-based. Um, you know, law enforcement collaboration has obviously fallen away since uh, the war in Ukraine. But there was a Ukrainian individual working for one of these Russian criminal groups. Uh, he saw what had happened in the world and was very fed up with it, uh, understandably. And so he decided to leak a lot of the internal operations of this ransomware group, effectively. He just dumped all of the internal chats, all of some of the internal documents that told people how to do this hacking. Uh, it was all in Russian, but through translating it, you can piece together, effectively, how they run this. Um, and al although I doubt they use you know, a big ERP platform, they're probably not on Microsoft Dynamics or Salesforce, they really are treating this like a kind of, well, you know, we've got these three targets and we're going to go after those because we think they're the best in terms of you know, value for money, likelihood of getting a, a sort of uh, an extortion payment out of them. And uh, in one client that we helped, they went back through a negotiator and yeah, they said, well, we're very poor. You know, woe is us, small company. We haven't got very much money in our bank. You know, please, could you reduce that payment a little bit and we'll think about it. And the ransomware group came back and said, well, sure, here's a copy of your cyber insurance policy that we copied off of your systems. And here is the screenshot from your bank account that your finance person took last month. We know you can afford this. Therefore, the fee is however many million it was at the time. Um, yeah, these are, they are effectively very organized, very well-run criminal groups that know what they're doing. Uh, in the most part, some of them are slightly more terrible. But. Um, and uh, I just put this on here as well. So there were 41 victims so far this year, specifically in media and entertainment. We don't track broadcast as a category, which is uh, something we, we went back and sort of talked about. That's up from 36. Um, but yeah, when I look through all of the different kind of categories and sectors that we track, this is our tracking of those sites that you saw before with the kind of passports on. So they put a nice post on, they say, oh, I've hacked this organization. They've got seven days to talk with us, otherwise we're going to release all their data. We track that and um, you know, there have been many uh, hundreds this year that we've tracked publicly. There's, of course, more that don't ever make it into the public domain. So this number is, is lower than, of course, it, uh, it could be. Right, I want to talk about the say what, because uh, consciously we've got a few minutes left. Um, I've selected a number of articles, and if you look, if you can kind of zoom in, <laughs> if you can zoom in on the dates on some of these, you'll notice these are not all from the last few months. I've purposely actually gone back, and this, the one on the left-hand side here is from 2016, so this is not a new problem. I think it was the point I was trying to make there. Um, and we're not scraping the barrel. These are kind of a few of quite a lot of articles that we've seen. Um, on the left here, you know, France's TV5, allegedly destroyed almost by Russian hackers. Um, I always like to kind of make sure that I've sourced any claims like this very carefully. Uh, I think if you go back, actually, there is a publication from the UK government, which uh, effectively, you know, as close as you can get, says, yes, this was the Russians. I think, believe it was the GRU, which is their kind of military intelligence uh, unit. On the right-hand side, we see Sinclair hit by a uh, ransomware attack. This was an American broadcaster. Um, and in that case, TV stations were actually disrupted. So in my mind, you have all your boring corporate stuff and then you have broadcast and they're worlds apart and they're not connected. So it's perfectly safe. You could still broadcast. In this case, that obviously was not the case. I, I don't have any inside information, um, but clearly this kind of attack does affect uh, broadcasters too. Um, on the left-hand side, so I bet if we asked for a show of hands, there'd be loads of you that are using AWS or uh, any of the other cloud platforms. Uh, in this case, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation was using AWS. They were storing their data there. It's obviously quite cheap. I saw all my backups in AWS. Unfortunately, they had not protected that. Um, and you know, it says advanced uh, video content here. So, you know, videos for shows that hadn't been broadcast yet, years of backups, and also other things like passwords and other internal data uh, were leaked because it was not appropriately secured. So obviously not an ideal situation to be in. Um, and on the right-hand side, Iran State Broadcaster was hacked during a nightly news program by a kind of hacktivist group. And uh, there isn't an embedded video, so don't worry if you're sitting there worried that I'm going to uh, click play. But yeah, this effectively, uh, they hacked it and they posted sort of uh, you know, messages effectively defacing that website. Uh, and again, why should we care? Because all of this stuff, right, okay, we drop off air for five minutes. That's not great. You know, there's probably contractual penalties. Uh, but on the left-hand side, we actually see the opposite of this. So we see the Iranian authorities alleging, allegedly hacking individuals who send in media clips for broadcast on foreign TV. So I'm in Iran. I see a, an incident I want to kind of, I want the rest of the world to see. And I send that, well, actually, where are those being stored? 
you know, the, the nice version of your video that goes out with a kind of face blur and a dark room for your sort of panorama type program. You know, obviously that's nicely edited, it's very carefully uh, controlled, but you know, where's all the raw video for that? And if that's sitting in a cloud bucket unprotected, you know, there's obviously potentially risks to life. You know, I hope that's not sort of overly dramatic. And then the right-hand side, this is one from much more recently. This was from last month. Uh, again, don't have any inside information, not a firm that we've worked with, but uh, KNP Logistics is, it was a UK company. Uh, they ship things around the country. Uh, and they filed for insolvency uh, due to a ransomware attack. So they had an attack and you know, they, they have said that is the reason that they are now insolvent. So 730 jobs potentially lost. You know, another bit of their business had to be sold off to a competitor. Obviously a, a huge issue if you are a smaller uh, or at the smaller end of that scale. Um, and so what can I do? Hopefully we've not terrified everyone, uh, sort of give up on technology. <laughs> um, I, I've put three things on here and I'd love to sort of solicit a chat afterwards with people about what or maybe in the, the Q&A after this. Um, there's three kind of areas. I think number one is getting the basics right. And I think when I look across our clients that have operational technology, you know, we help companies that operate equipment on oil rigs. Um, I hope to goodness I don't have to fly out to one on a helicopter. Uh, but yeah, they've got safety critical equipment in parts of the, you know, the world that could explode. All these, you know, these very dramatic things. And actually, they have to rely on these security basics just the same as an organization that is perhaps sending emails all day. Um, and some of those security basics are things like good passwords, two-factor authentication, network hygiene. Hopefully you'll we'll talk in the next session about uh, some of these. Um, and actually these are, when we look back at the causes of incidents and the things that when we look at the recommendations we've give clients and you know, they, they go back and they say, well, I wish I'd done this before. Actually, a lot of these security basics are the things that they didn't get right and they wish they had. Um, and that's not always easy because, you know, I, Kind of in my spare time, I love playing with uh, like lighting and other things. You, know, you plug into this equipment and it's all very old, doesn't support strong passwords or you know, it's certainly not two-factor authentication. Um, you know, very old protocols, but actually some of these things really do stop these incidents from becoming much bigger than they could be. Um, documenting any workarounds. So again, when we talk to our clients, they know which bits of their business are the problem. You know, they know that it's the little company they bought last year that's super special, is making loads of money. They've been told they're not allowed to touch them. It's like the goose that lays the golden egg. Please don't, you know, don't go barge in their IT and make their lives difficult. Uh, but yeah, actually, it's often those smaller companies or the new acquisition or the business unit that's really cool and really trendy and you know, no one's allowed to kind of add security. They are the ones often that cause these types of issues. Um, engaging with third party providers and challenging them. So actually, a lot of our clients that do security really well, the trouble they have is with their third parties. Um, actually talking to them about how they're securing their own stuff is really valuable. Uh, and actually, for a lot of our bigger clients now that are much more mature, they can help their third parties to really think about how to do this. You know, lessons learned, sharing experience. Um, I helped a client two years ago now who uh, I ended up on some fantastic calls with some very interesting organizations, you know, very big, very well-known household brands, basically going there and saying, well, look, our clients had this incident, we're helping them to resolve it. And one of them was beating his fist on the desk and said, we've got 400 cyber people waiting for your report. Why isn't it done? And I had to explain that our client had 170 employees. This, this big organization had more people doing cybersecurity than our client had people in their whole business worldwide. So that disparity you know, can be big. And actually, if you're one of the larger organizations here, just working with your cybersecurity team, talking to some of your supply chain could be really helpful. And test it until it breaks. So something I do, I lead a lot of our ethical hacking engagements. Uh, we do it for some really fantastic clients. So we effectively send some smart people with a laptop and some very cool tools and try break stuff. Uh, either from the outside or from the inside. You know, they might give us one of their laptops and we get to kind of hack it from the inside. Um, and actually, uh, this, you know, th this kind of testing can really quickly uncover all of their low-hanging fruit. That If you fix, you make an attacker's life much more difficult. And frankly, if you are a criminal group based in Russia and you can hack 100 companies and 10 of those have enough security that it's a bit of a pain, you're going to focus your attention elsewhere. So actually just raising that bar very slightly, small incremental things can be a big change. Uh, check the network segregation, access control, things like that working properly. Uh, Mark and I had a fantastic talk about 802.1x <laughs> last week when we were, uh, I was talking about how hard our clients find to implement their kind of strong security for network ports. And again, hopefully, uh, Gerard, you'll talk about that afterwards. 
Um, especially that boundary between, say, broadcast and corporate. And this is, again, where we find large clients with big operational technology networks, big corporate networks, and then they plug the two together. And actually, it's that interface where they kind of meet that is the point that is the weakest. Um, and then encryption. So we're going to hear from our fourth speaker today around uh, content protection. You know, in this industry, obviously, absolutely critical. You look at all of the TV shows that are being sent out from this building. They are all billion-dollar sports and entertainment businesses. And actually, if you can stream that for free to you know, a bunch of people abroad, that's not a good thing. Uh, and then lastly, make a plan. So this is something I spend a lot of time with our clients, certainly at board level, talking about. How would you respond if there are an incident? So it might be that you're sitting in your AB truck or your kind of edit suite or your, yeah, your uh, kind of program room, whatever, and actually you can just do your job because you don't need all this stuff. Yeah? You've got printed copies of what's going to happen that day. You can use your phone and talk to people, and that's great. And actually that is perfect resilience. But for a lot of things now where all of these things are so automated, actually running a kind of mock scenario where you say, right, this afternoon we're going to test what happens if this key system is no longer available to us. Yeah, we're going to test what happens if we can't receive an email halfway through a match. All of these things can really help you to build in that security from the start. And uh, I think the kind of key question I left there was, could you go live without corporate IT, you know, without that? And could you fall back to WhatsApp and do your day job? And I suspect perhaps yes. But if it hasn't been tested, it won't be very smooth the first time. Uh, and I'll leave a few useful links here. Um, NTSC have something called the Cyber Central Scheme. This is the National Cyber Security Centre. It's a government body. Uh, that helps the UK effectively to be more secure. So they offer advice right from small businesses all the way up to central government, multinational organisations. Um, Ofcom, um, there is now the uh, Network Security and Resilience. There's an act effectively that if you are a big telecoms provider, you have to comply with. Uh, the TSR, um, and they've put together some useful stuff. I mean, it's aimed at, I'm a big carrier and I've got you know, multiple kind of telecom services running, uh, or I'm running uh, an essential service for the UK, but actually there's some useful guidance in there in terms of the standards that they expect people to meet are you know, good uh, baseline. Uh, and then there is, um, it's a few years old now, I poked the person in the team that's responsible for writing it, uh, but the NTSC also has a guidance for cybersecurity for major events. And although it's not technical for you, know, you folk in this room, who are kind of understand what each end of a cable does. It's not that exciting, but it is something that's useful to give to you, say, person planning this to say, you know what, have you thought about this alongside all of the other risks that you do? And it literally walks you through. You talk to this team about how they would do this, talk to another team, you know, challenge uh, the person doing this. So it's very helpful for those that are organizing those type of events. And then we have a global telecom and entertainment outlook. This is our view at PwC of where the sector is going. So a lot of the things that you're doing day to day on the ground are obviously right now or you're planning for the next few years um, and again you know, we haven't we haven't necessarily layered cybersecurity directly into this but it's where we are going with our thinking around this